Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new Preds talk show called On the Preds with me, your host, Alex Darty of A to Z Sports, and my new co-host, Sean Smith of On the Forecheck. For those of you familiar with the previous A to Z Sports Preds podcast, uh, you can think of this as just a next stage in evolution of the show rather than a brand new show, even though we do have a new title. Um, previously, you might remember Chris Link was my co-host. He has since moved out of state to bigger and better things. We, of course, wish him all the best. But Sean has agreed to take his place, and uh, we're really excited about that. Glad to have him on. We also, if you will notice, have a brand new format. So if you're listening to this on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, you might not notice this, but uh, you will probably notice it if you're watching it on YouTube because you'll notice that we've added video. And this show is going to be uploaded to YouTube every Sunday for your listening and viewing pleasure. Uh, this is going to be on our A to Z Sports YouTube channel. So go to that channel, subscribe. we got a lot of subscribers there. We're really excited about it. Every single Sunday, we will upload this video to YouTube. So benefits of having YouTube is, number one, you can see us. You can see Sean and I as we talk about the Preds. You can also see, uh, we'll, we'll probably show some, some highlights from time to time, break down film, talk about big saves, interviews with players, uh, any big moments that would just make this uh, kind of viewing experience or listening experience even better for you. With that all being said, let's go ahead and get started. Sean, how are you, man? I'm doing great, Alex. I've uh, been on spring break or fall break, I guess, for a week. So I uh, have to head back to work tomorrow, but it's been a nice nine days off. Spent some time yeah. uh, camping and got to check out the uh, preseason game last night or yesterday afternoon. Yes. So that was pretty nice. Yeah. So last night, Sean and I were at the preseason game in Nashville. Uh, definitely the first time. Uh, well, it, it's not the first time I've been in the building uh, in a while, but um, with the new requirements, you know, obviously yeah. either vaccinated or negative tests. Uh, that made a big difference, um, and you know there were there were plenty of fans there for a preseason game. I mean, what did you think of the atmosphere at the, at the game last night? The atmosphere is good. You know, of course, I think when the game started, it seemed like I was wondering if people were going to trickle in and have the place kind of fill up. But it seemed like as the game got going, more people filled in the seats and uh, got pretty loud in there, considering the all the hype about the new goal horn and everything. I was curious to see how that would be. That's right. Um, That's why people showed up. They just wanted to yeah. hear the goal horn. They, they heard the goal, goal horn. horn. They heard the goal horn, and then they just left. They were like, oh, I got it now. I understand. <laughs> you know what was funny about the goal horn is someone on my Twitter feed, I had posted a video of it, and someone was breaking it down like, I think there's a minor seventh in there, uh, but it's not a straight minor seventh. Like, this is Nashville for you. Yeah. You got music fans who are, who are into audio and breaking down uh, how things sound. So I thought that was pretty funny. It was. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, you you always wonder. I think I heard once that like uh, horns and cars are like in the key of F or something. So I yeah. guess like I don't know. There you go. So uh, obviously, there's a lot to talk about with this team. You know, th there's there's not um, there's there's no real easy way to just t cover an entire off season in one episode, and we're not really going to try to do that. Obviously, Pecorino has retired. Ryan Ellis has been traded to Philadelphia. Kelly Yarncrook is gone. Uh, there, there's, a, there's been a lot of changes. Um, there's been some new faces, uh, some, some new, new players have come in. We've got some young players that are fighting for roster spots right now. We're going to talk about that. Um, when you think about this off season, I'm kind of throwing this at you right now, right off the bat, but when you think about this off season, what stands out most to you from the off season, as we've seen it the last few months, What's, what's like the biggest thing you remember? I think there's probably an obvious one, but what's what's the biggest thing that you could say about this offseason? Well, I think the biggest thing for me, and, and this is, you know, I started covering the team at least where I had access to the players and things like that right before the end of the LaViolette era. And so I think seeing John Hines get a chance to actually have a full camp, the first full camp he's had with his team has kind of been, uh, for me, eye-opening because you see the way yeah. he works with the players. And and having had the chance to see a little bit of the way LaViolette worked with the players before, and to me, the comparison, it's 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 night and day, really. And so I see someone who's teaching hockey getting the chance to teach hockey. And you can see the players kind of starting to work within those parameters that are being set for them. Right. Um, I've enjoyed that. But if you want to talk about the actual on-the-ice stuff, um, I've really thought that – Yakov Trenin has stood out to me as far as the way he's improved mm -hmm. um, in all aspects mm -hmm. of the game. 
that was, yeah. and, and I think capped off for me was I was at training camp one day and they were practicing the shootout and he scored a, a really nasty backhand goal <laughs> um, that I think you kind of saw echoes of last, last night on the, during the game. Yeah. We're definitely going to talk about, talk about Trenton and some of the, some of the younger guys as well. Let's go ahead and talk about what this roster looks like. Uh, obviously, they have to get down to 23 by Monday at 4 o'clock. That is uh, not very long or not very far away. Um, right now, the roster is at 28. Um, I have a pretty pretty good idea of what the roster is going to look like at this point. You know, it, as the roster gets whittled down as it goes on throughout the, the preseason, you know, you get, uh, you get moments where you're like, wow, is um, – you know, is, is Patrick Harper going to make this team? Is Jeremy Davies going to make this team Is you know, you have these moments of like, I don't know exactly who's going to make the team. Who's not. And then, you know, you reality sets in and you're like, no, no, it, it, such and such, you know, is not going to beat Nick cousins. Uh, Igor Afanasiev, as good as he has been, he's not going to beat out Nick cousins for a roster spot. You know, um, Rem Pitlick who got waived and then picked up by Minnesota didn't beat out, you know, Rocco Grimaldi or someone like that. So there, there's been a lot of a lot of uh, roster, you know, during the the roster cutdowns. There's been some moments where you're like, yeah, that makes sense that these guys are being cut down. But now we're to really the final the final cuts, and like I said, they have to get down, they have to get down to 23 so that we have to have at least five more cuts. Here are. Here are my cuts. Here's what I think the, the, the final cuts will be. I think that they will get down to 14 forwards, which means they have to cut two more forwards. I think those forwards will be Michael McCarron and Afanasiev, Igor Afanasiev, who has had a great camp. He's not done anything to get cut other than just be the odd man out. I mean, I, I think he is a guy that I think would be really good in Milwaukee. But do you, do you agree with those, those, uh, those options there, McCarron and uh, Afanasiev as being the last two cut? I would say that's accurate. Uh, if you're looking at the other guys that would be left, you're going to have uh, Olivier and Grimaldi, um, Tomasino staying up. Uh, it, it makes sense to me. Personally, Afanasiev, I think he looks great out there. And as, yeah. as Hines said last night, um, there's no one left that's done anything wrong. There's no one yeah. left that's had a bad camp. Um, what it comes down to for me, as far as Igor goes, is I want to see him in the best position to continue developing. And, and right now, I think that's in Milwaukee. Right. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Afanasiev definitely seems like a Milwaukee guy to start to start out. I, I think that at this point, that means Tomasino has made the roster. I, I think that right now, I think not only has he made the roster, uh, as we were talking about last night, Sean, um, I think it's possible that he makes the roster and, and is in the starting lineup on opening night, as opposed to just a healthy scratch, because why would you play him uh, or why would you put him in? Uh, um, why would you put him on the 23 if he's not going to play? So I, I, that, which, which would mean someone like Grimaldi and probably Olivier would get scratched. But uh, yeah, Tomasino making that final cut would be, would be huge. I mean, the guy has been, I mean, I don't think that there's been a better offensive prospect on the Predators ever. I mean, to be honest, even even Forsberg was good. I mean, I, people knew he was going to be good. No one really thought he was going to be as good as he is now. Um, and T Tomasino's production in the minor leagues, OHL, you know, AHL as well, far exceeds anything the Predators have ever had. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I think with Tomasino, you know, you've gotten a lot of fans who've kind of come on the bandwagon after the cup run, and they've gotten really hyped up about someone like Ellie Tolvanen, and yeah. his development path is just, I would say, quite different than what a lot of people were expecting. I, I used to joke that people expected him to come into the league on like a, a flaming chariot of goal production, and that never really happened. And, and you're looking at him now, he's playing on the second line, um, you know, apparently and probably starting you know the season in nashville as opposed to on the taxi squad last season so um oh, tomasino oh yeah the taxi, the taxi squad, squad. sorry tomasino on the other hand um <laughs> i'm not saying that on the third line you're going to see him come in and and score a thousand goals or anything but he's coming in probably in a better position to start producing and playing some solid minutes than anyone else has been in a while uh, yeah, I, I think part of it, I think, is 
He's outshined a lot of other players in camp. That's part of it. The other part is they need some energy uh, or they, they need some forward uh, skill that can outshine yeah. and 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 do do well early on in this team because they like just from a organizational standpoint they need some positivity from players who are under 25 years old yeah. because they're tired of hearing about Ryan Johansson and Matthew Shane not producing they're tired of hearing about Philip Forsberg not taking that next step they're tired of hearing about how they traded Victor Arvidsson they're tired of hearing you know oh they got they still got old old guys in the in the mix with Mikhail Granlund and, and Nick Cousins and stuff. They need desperately a young kid who's 19 to come in and just light things on fire. And I, yeah. if that happens, and this is why I think people are a little – people who are bearish on the on the Predators, and I, I think for, for not a good reason, if Tomasino comes in and is that force, this team is a playoff team yeah. without a doubt in my mind. You know? I agree, big time. And I, you look at, and I, I've got an article coming out about this on Monday, um, but you look at the lineup as it stands, and it seems like your top six are pretty well set. Mm -hmm. um, Tomasino is going to slot in on that third line. Yeah. And, and what that allows him to do is it allows him to get a good amount of NHL minutes, um, but it also gives him maybe enough of a break that he's not – wearing himself out immediately like they might want him to play a little more sheltered minutes. And of course, but, I, I think that argument's a little silly. I mean, he's probably, you know, 19, he's got more energy than most guys on the team. Um, but getting used to that workload in the NHL, which are going to be heavier minutes, I'd much rather have him on the third line than on the fourth. And, you know, yeah. well, I'd love to say put him with some guys with a little more skill on the second, but he's he's gonna, probably going to be paired with glass. And, and that yes. to me is pretty intriguing. They had a yeah. really nice moment in the game last night where they had a two-on-one. Uh, Glass elected to pass to Tomasino. didn't connect, but um, oh, that's yeah, the kind of chemistry point. you want to see young guys developing on the team if they're going to be playing together. And I think I'd rather have that happening at the NHL level than the AHL level right now. So a uh, big argument for him being there. And if they do kind of become that, that spark plug on that third line, then you're going to see a team that's a threat um, pretty much through three lines, and we know what the fourth line can do based on last season. Mm -hmm. The people, anyone who is worried that Tomasino is going to get third line minutes and that that's a concern for them, uh, just quickly remind, remind yourself this is not the third line with Nick Bonino or yeah. Callie Yarncroke or right. even Kyle Turris. Uh, where you know you're fighting your play or, or Austin Watson, if you want to go back even that far, where where you're kind of playing a more uh, protected, uh, um, well, not protected, but you're, you're playing a more a more of a two way game, probably more of a physical game. Cody Glass is a playmaking center, like that that that's where he projects as. He does not project as a two way Mike Fisher type. He projects as a and not that he's bad at defense, but he definitely projects as a good puck skills kind of yeah. guy that can make plays. Um, now, Nick Cousins on the other side, a little bit, a little bit of a, a regressive uh, forward in that respect. He's definitely very, very physical. So that's a little different. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Nick Cousins doesn't last very long on that line, or if they shuffle things around and eventually it's Glass and Tomasino and someone like Grimaldi, and maybe Tomasino slides to the middle or plays right wing and then glasses i don't know however it works that they they slide in more skill on that line uh i realized nothing in heinz you know experience or nothing in heinz tenure here tells me that he will make uh um tons of changes there because he does like to stick with these guys but um i don't think that any, there's anything wrong with thomasino playing with cody glass like you mentioned i think that they have a lot they, they could build a lot of chemistry early and if you get it now when these kids are young Boy, you are set up for success yeah. in the future. Yeah, that that would be ideal. You want to see those guys kind of gel together. As Hind is a big proponent of line chemistry or line identity, and if you see these two kids set an identity for themselves and develop yeah. that chemistry quickly, you know that's going to be something you're going to talk about years down the road. Is Tomasino and Glass on the ice together, like you used to hear about the Jofa line or something like that? Right, so, right, right. That's that's something for me to get excited about. I'm I'm excited to watch that develop this season. So with Yossi, or let's talk about the defense real quick. So the, the defense, I think, is a little easier in terms of the cuts. 
Um, they're currently at nine defense. They have to get. I think they'll probably get down to seven. They could play eight, but then they would have to cut one of those other forwards. I don't think they'll do that. So they, they if they get down to seven forward, sorry, seven defense. That means that Jeremy Davies is going down in Milwaukee. He's exempt from waivers, so he'll he'll just go down to Milwaukee. And then they would have to cut Ben Harper, who would have to clear waivers. I think there's a very good chance that he will clear waivers. And if he doesn't, I don't think they're losing a whole lot. I mean, I, I know Ben Harper. I know a lot of people like him. Uh, I know John Hines likes him. Uh, but I just don't think that he's necessarily going to stick around uh, on this roster with the way it's constructed. Uh, so that would leave – Yossi, Carrier, uh, Ekholm, uh, Matias Ekholm, Philip Myers, who obviously came over from Philadelphia, for those of you that don't remember that, uh, Mark Borbietsky, who's back from injury, Dante Fabro, and then Matt Binning as the last. Because all those other guys are not waivers exempt, so except for Car- uh, no, Carrier is not. So, uh, no, yeah, no, none of the other defense are waivers exempt, and there's exactly seven of them. So I think that's where it's probably going to land. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, you know, they, they do like Ben Harper, and he's a big physical guy. Um, and I think you saw a lot more of Harper last season because you saw a lot less of Borvietsky. And Borvietsky's back. He's he's healthy. Benning kind of stepped into that, you know, more physical role when needed last season, and I thought he did it pretty well. Um, mm-hmm. But I think with those two back and healthy, um, it would make the most sense to me to send – Harper through the waivers process. Um, I think, again, I think a lot of people do like him on the team. I think, um, I think a lot of fans like the way he plays too, because he is a big body out there and he does some big body things. Well, Um, a lot of, a lot of fans don't like him too, though. (laughs) Well, I'm, I'm trying to be positive here. You know, I don't, I don't want to be negative all the time, but I I know that he has fans because I yeah, know that does. people like to see a big a big dude out there who's not afraid to hit people with his body and with his fists. So, um, you know, there is there is some argument for keeping him around, but I think a lot of the role that they want him to fill is going to be taken by a couple of other guys on the team that are healthy this year and last year with the ability to have players on the taxi squad. I think it was easier to kind of bring someone into that role when you needed to do it, which based on the injuries last season toward the – second half that they had to do that a lot. So I think yeah. pulling him out is probably the best call. Um, there's a big part of me that wonders if they're willing to pull the trigger on it though. Uh, so I'm, I'm most curious to see what happens there. Honestly, come, come Monday at four o'clock, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, is it the right move? Probably. Will it happen? I'd like to think so. But then again, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think you're right. And, and Ben Harper is a guy that, um, he, he very much fits what John Hines likes bigger, uh, more physical. Um, yeah. It, but I, I just think that yeah, at this point, he's probably the, the odd man out. I, I also don't think he'd get claimed. So I think he'd go straight to Milwaukee and play there and be fine. So, probably. um, so speaking of Milwaukee, I, I think that the, what, what would happen there is, you know, your first call-ups from, Oh, by the way, the, the, the easiest solution or the easiest part of the roster is the goalie part of the roster. UC Soros is the starter. David Riddick is the backup. That's yeah. it. Connor Ingram yeah. will go to Milwaukee and he'll he'll be the starter in Milwaukee. Yeah. So. Um, first call offs from Milwaukee will be Afanasiev, probably, maybe, uh, to, uh, Tommy Novak, who has looked pretty good. Yeah. Patrick yeah. Harper, maybe, maybe Michael McCarron. And then, uh, and then you've got a whole slew of other guys. Um, that are escaping me now, but you, you've got, you've got a bunch of other guys that are down there that could, could easily step into a role um, and, and come up for on offense or at forward rather, I should say. And then uh, defense, I think Jeremy Davies could get a call up. Maybe we see uh, David Ference this year. I, I think that that could happen. Um, so I, I don't know about Frederick Allard. It doesn't seem like Allard is really a part of this the the process anymore um no. uh i mean i would almost I, I i wouldn't be surprised if we saw someone like that del Gaizo before we yeah. saw Allard. just seems like Allard is just the odd man i have no idea why they've just totally forgotten about him and not not focused on him but i don't know what do you think i i'm with you i was really thinking that Allard was going to get his chance last season and get a get a bigger chance than he did but you saw the emergence of someone like Davies come up and play more minutes or yeah. uh, Carrier come up and play more minutes. And I think those guys have definitely made their case for roster spots uh, during the preseason. So 
Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if the team or the organization sours on some prospects. You'd like to think that maybe during the preseason when they put somebody on waivers that there's a gentleman's agreement of some type to say, hey, you know, we're sending these guys on the minors hands off. But then you occasionally see players picked up by other teams like you saw with Pitlick. So, um, you know, Pitlick, somebody that I would think they would have wanted to protect uh, a little bit more, but he got picked up. So I don't know if that meant that they said, hey, you can pick this guy up if you want him we're kind of yeah a lot of people were asking a lot of people were asking i think it's fair i mean why 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 not keep pitlick up and send michael mccarran down he's much more likely to get claimed i I don't know it and that's why i have to think there's some kind of agreement in place with if we put a guy on waivers during the preseason we'll let you know if they're available or not um you know it's it's kind of like unless it's one of those uh, (laughs) way that a team can get revenge through like a uh um I don't know. I don't really know what they'd be getting revenge for. Well, but And I, um, I pointed out, I mean, I, I don't think Minnesota is, is in any better better position to keep him either, unless he just lights it up. I, I do know last night that he played with uh, Kevin Fiala in the preseason. So that was and Goudreau. Good. And Goudreau, right. Former so, uh, a former Preds line. Yeah, that was there's yeah. there's a lot of that going on up there. So so uh but if they cut him, if they excuse me, if they wave him, um I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Predators snag him back up. So it may be not over for the Rim Pitlick fans out there, which yeah. I think he's definitely got a lot of skill. So I think he could easily be back on this team. But let's talk about this real quick because I thought about this curveball. Uh, I, I remembered this from a couple of years ago. Um, Laviolette, at least twice, I know that at least twice he did this. Um, and, and, and I, this, you know, opening night roster aside, it's pretty frequently the, uh, a Nashville Predators thing. To, to keep to keep an open roster spot to, to, to not have 23 to keep 22 sometimes even 21 on your roster uh, because they like their Milwaukee they, they like the relationship they have with their AHL affiliate and so they get more people playing uh, it gives you a little bit more flexibility so what if Hines goes with an open roster spot on opening night and so we have 22 instead of 23 in that case I think it's likely that Tomasino will be the one that's down in in, uh, in Milwaukee. And so I thought about that and I was like, that could easily happen. I could definitely see that. The the only way it would happen, I think, is if they just decided Thomas, we don't want Tomasino playing on in, 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 in X role. We'd rather have Grimaldi there. Right. uh, You know what we get uh, to get the season started, right. Get, get, get comfortable first. Then we can bring him up for his debut and we can, we can uh, choreograph, his his sort of development this year a little bit easier i don't know i i that that could happen i i really i i don't know that i would agree with that i think that thomas you know i think just go ahead and get it done get the the opening night uh debut out of the way and get him going and then see how see how he progresses uh it it's possible like you said if they decide they don't want him playing in a specific role or if the line he's going to play on is not going to have a playmaking identity as much as they would like um i can i can see them sitting him down because he's going to go to the ahl and he's going to play on the top line he's going to get top line minutes and he's going to blow it up but if they want to bring him back up they can it just at some point to me it it seems a little silly to kind of do the yo-yo thing with him where he's up and down throughout the whole season it's just a lot of and i i know i actually asked heinz last night about the relationship with milwaukee and he, he mentioned that you know, the coaching style is the same, the structure is the same. So it's really easy to take a player and plug them in when needed. Um, But I, I, my hope would be that they're going to be a team that's going to try to get that third line scoring um, Mm -hmm. and need him there instead of sending him to the AHL. Right. Yeah. I I think that's, Boy, I, I really wish I hadn't thought about it because I feel like I spoke it into existence when I tweeted about it. But I, it, it could it could happen. And um, and boy, I think a lot of fans would be disappointed because they really want to see – they just want some energy. They want some yeah. sc- scoring energy. Like it's, it's one thing to have like a young defenseman like Carrier come up and, and you know, participate uh, or, you know, be, be, be a good player. But it's another thing to have just like a dynamic young forward that can go out and, and score goals – um that's just fun that's fun for fans people like that uh speaking of fun for fans uh i wanted to uh to show something really quick and then talk about this guy who we mentioned earlier um and uh there's there's a couple things here um that that i wanted to cover with him 
I think this is going to be one of the most exciting parts of the Nashville Predators this year. I think it was last year, if you paid attention. Um, and I'm uh, really excited about this. But go ahead, let's go ahead and watch this real quick. Take a look. And this one kicks back over. Now some room to operate for Trenick. Trenick moving ahead. Trenick, he scores! Oh, the Trenin train had an extra gear. It's 2-1 Nashville. Well, Yakov Trenin, he plays on the herd line. He's got a lot of physicality in his game, but the kid has a lot of skill. And watch when he gets the puck. Watch the separation. He takes a look. He sees Jelena, he takes two hard strikes, gets that separation, long reach, and this is what you want to do, open up the goaltender there, he gets Anderson to bite, opens up that five hole and just guides it right in here. Yakov Trinin. So, all right, that was a pretty awesome goal. Uh, it was. Here's, here, here's what I wanted to talk about with this. First of all, the goal, because, um, look, it's preseason, and there's a lot of things you can take away from well, sorry, there's not a lot you can take away from the preseason, but there's there's at least a couple things you can. Um, I think if you if you look at the way that kids are skate kids, <laughs> look at the way that guys are skating, and you look at the way that they play with confidence and are they comfortable, um, <clears throat> and then just their puck skills overall. Are they are they are they in midseason form with their puck skills? Is their passing crisp? Their are there are they controlling the puck easier or are they struggling to do that? Are they flubbing? Are they, are they able to control the puck off of a pass off of a shot? Um, are they, you know, positioning is not something I'm actually kind of watching in the preseason because that's more tactically like, you know, whether, a, whether a center comes down more into the zone, whether they stay high, whether wings are really, really pressing forward or whether they're staying back all that stuff tactically the preseason, just ignore same thing with defense. That's why I don't really watch the defenders in preseason. Um, but when you watch a guy like that, Jakob Trenin, skating full bore on the puck into the deep, it, onto the goalie, looking like he's about to destroy the goalie, not score, but just destroy him. And uh, and then Deke, with that kind of skill to open up a goaltender like Frederick Anderson, slide it uh, through the five hole. Um, I think Jakob Trenin could just have a fantastic year. Um, and, and when I saw that last night, I thought, man, this guy is ready to even take – even go on last year's success and go up even further. I, I agree. And based on what I saw out of, out of camp and things like that, not just the preseason games, he looks like he's ready to go. Um, he looks, he's not getting, he's not getting tired. And even the first few scrimmages I watched during, during camp where you saw a lot of guys kind of, you know, you could tell that they were looking to go to the bench. Trenton looked like he was ready to go the whole game. Yeah. Um, he, he, I noticed last night, especially that he really seemed to go down and harry the other team when they were trying to get set up behind the net, yeah. he was relentless in that. And if He's, you're looking at him doing that on, on one end of the goal, and then at the same time coming down and, and just picking up a, picking up a puck and going down and, and just scoring a powerful goal against that team, um, yeah. this is a guy who's ready to go. I think he's ready to go out and prove himself this season and show what he could really do. I wanted you to talk about for just a second, if you, if you could, just, you know, a, a minute or so about what um, – so you, you had told me last night that you had talked to Carl Taylor, the Milwaukee yeah. uh, Admirals head coach, uh, about Trennan and Janot specifically because those two are a nice pair for the Predators to move forward with for a number of years. I mean, like the, these guys yeah. are a physical, speedy, skilled fourth-line pair – that you know, right now Sissons is in between them, and he, he's with the team for a while. So like Sissons is a good anchor there. Um, what is it that you remember Carl Carl Taylor told you about those guys specifically? So the thing with Carl Taylor, and, and this I thought this was really interesting. And I, you know, I'm I'm a teacher, so I, I really kind of get into the whole teaching side of coaching. Um, yeah, Carl Taylor kind of helps the players identify what their core strengths are as a player. These are the things that they're going to come out and do every night, every time they play. Um, when we were talking about Ellie Tolvin and he talked about how he was uh, a skilled shooter and that was his core strength. That was a thing he was always good at. He says that then they're going to start adding layers to their game so that when they do get the chance to come up and play in the NHL, they're going to have more than just, well, here comes this guy who's a good shooter. Well, now he's playing defensively. And if you look at the development of Tolvanen, you'll see that he is really matured as a defensive player as well. 
So with someone like Janot, and what was really, really eye-opening to me about Janot is, and I didn't realize this until Carl Taylor told me, and that's probably probably my fault, is that Janot is someone who is uh, undrafted all the way from junior levels all the way up to the NHL. Yeah, talk and about so, coming, out of, coming out of nowhere. I mean, yeah, absolutely nowhere, not on anybody's radar, but earning contracts at each level, each step of the way up to say that this is a guy that if I talk to him and say, here's what you need to do to get better, he's going to do everything he can do from the point I tell him until the next time he's on the ice to make those things happen. And what you're seeing with Jano is someone who has taken all of those lessons at every level and, and applied them and has come all the way up through this, this system to where he's earned an NHL contract and he's mm-hmm. going out and he's not just out there playing. He's not just a body. He's someone who you kind of need to look out for him on the ice because he can hurt you physically. He's quick and he can score as well. Yakov Trenin, I mean, he's a he's a big guy, number one. So like you said, it didn't look like he was just going to score. It looked like he was going to destroy the goalie. So he can be very menacing out there. But then you need to add add all those other layers to his game. And so the layers you're adding to his game are, of course, the to, to be uh, relentless on the puck on every side of the ice or every part of the ice, but then also to get those skills in there with shooting. And I think you saw those last night. He had a beautiful, beautiful shootout goal during the uh, preseason that uh, I got on video. But um, that was pretty nasty. And, and you're seeing someone who I think has had the time to improve their game and add those layers that they need in order to be successful at the highest level. Yeah, one thing I noticed that uh, Jakob Trenin, or not Jakob Trenin, but, but Tanner Janot did uh, <clears throat> last night. So t- they both scored in, in the preseason. Obviously, that's that's great to see. Uh, but but when he got that when he got that uh, um, turnover, um, he was uh, he was very like uh, <laughs> look. It would be very easy for a a young guy, like you said, not not drafted. Now he's he played played plenty of games last year, but. Um, when, when you get a turnover like that in the offensive zone, you don't expect it. You don't expect a, such a bad turnover to be right there yeah. in the slot or high slot kind of circle area. Uh, just with, with no defender on you yeah. ready, ready for a shot, just on an open goal. You don't expect it. I mean, like it, 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 NHL and all stars, hall of famers don't expect that. I mean, it just doesn't happen that often. And he turned when he got the puck, he turned with such quick. Uh, he, he turned very quickly onto the goal and just fires a shot right by uh, Frederick Anderson. I think it was still Anderson at that time. And uh, that was like, I think any other young kid would have just uh, frozen, you know, yeah. like hesitated. Uh, oh God, what do I do? Uh, is there someone open? He just he did not even think. He just it was it was an instinct turn and shoot. He had good really good body positioning, so he knew exactly where he was going to have to shoot on the goal in order to get a high probability of a, of a goal. Um, it was just really smart, and 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 I think it really said a lot about where he is right. Excuse me, where he is right now. Um, he is a very comfortable uh, player. He feels like he belongs here. He does not feel out of place, like we've maybe seen with some other players uh, who've come up from Milwaukee. He just seems so comfortable, and I think that's really great to see. So. Um, yeah, Tanner Jano and Jakob Trenin, those two uh, have been have been excellent. Uh, I was going to try to I was going to try to share my screen to show this this uh, image, but there's a, a picture of both of them. They brought them both out for uh, for the post game press conference. Yeah. Which was cool. They brought both both Tanner Jano and Jakob Trenin, as if to say like these guys are just. I mean, they're going to be bringing players out like that all season, but um, I would not be surprised if that's if again in the future we see those two come out together like as twinsies to, to <laughs> talk to the media they want they want chemistry they want identity and those guys oh, yeah. definitely bring the same um same approach to uh playing hockey with them so it makes yeah. a lot of sense to me so we're uh we're, we're almost through here with our first episode um i do want to talk about the week ahead obviously the predators have real nhl games coming up this week they have two um thursday they start with seattle um the new nhl team very odd to start your season with a a team that is brand new but you know that's what's that that's what the schedule makers decided so they the seattle kraken come into nashville on thursday 
to uh, um, talk to, to talk to, to play, just to, to have play, a conversation, <laughs> just have a conversation with the Nashville Predators. Uh, um, 7 p.m. Home, home opener. And then Saturday, guess what? The Predators get to play the Carolina Hurricanes again. Uh, for like the 10th time in the last 11 games or something stupid Oof. like that. Uh, seen a lot of Carolina. Man, it's got to be so frustrating for them to play them again. Uh, what do you think about these two matchups? Uh, you know, Seattle on Thursday, Carolina on Saturday. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about, about seeing Seattle, you know, honestly. Um, you've heard so much for the past several seasons about preparing for and protecting players for and in all of these, we're not going to get burnt like we did last time with Vegas about this expansion draft and, and the draft is over and that that's not a part of the conversation anymore. And, and worrying about, you know, how many games a certain prospect has played so they won't be draft eligible. And, and uh, you know, that that's something that I'm ready to be done with. So in that sense, I'm very ready to see the Kraken. Um, but other than that, it's just exciting when there's a new team, you get a good up, up close look at them early on in the season. And of course, if that means the return of Callie Yarncroke to Nashville, I'm excited about that because he's someone boy that, boy that Cali. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm boy excited Cali. to see my boy boy. So yeah. um, <laughs> that that should be good if for no other reason than that. Also excited about the uh, the first pairing, Jamie Oleksiak. That should be pretty uh, pretty intense and pretty interesting. That first that first pairing they've got on defense looks pretty hardcore. So um, curious to see what kind of game they play. Uh, looking forward to see what their identity is as a team as well. Carolina, yeah, uh, tired of seeing them. Seattle, yeah, right. <laughs> we don't need to break down them anymore. Uh, they do have some changes, but uh, the, the Seattle lineup is very interesting. So I looked at it. Uh, I just was looking around at you know some Seattle Kraken blogs, which now exist, and uh, you know the, the lineup looks a little better than I thought it was going to. I remember thinking. Um, when they drafted, because the, their draft was not as good as Vegas. Vegas's was. Vegas just no. stocked up on so much talent. Yeah. And, uh, but even then, people didn't think Vegas was going to do what they did in their first season. No. Um, I really thought at, when Seattle drafted that that they were really leaving a lot on the table. That they didn't they didn't get some key players. Like I thought they were going to get Jonathan Quick. Uh, I knew they were. I had a feeling they were going to get Jordan Eberle, who's probably going to be their top line scorer. I didn't think they were going to get Jaden Schwartz. So the yeah. top line's not bad. They got some punch on the wings. I mean, like they're they're Schwartz and uh, Everly and uh, and yep. Don Coy is a good player. Obviously, Cali Yarncroke. Like those are good good wingers down the middle. I think that they're going to struggle. I mean, Jared McCann is he really a top line center? Alexander Winberg had a really good start, but then just has not done anything in Columbus. Uh, Morgan Geeky is a good third line center, I think. Um, yeah. Fourth line, there's there's just there's some pieces at the bottom that make that are fine, uh, and then their defense is okay. I mean, it's kind of kind of older. Mark Giordano is, you know, he won a Norris Trophy recently, so that's not bad. Uh, Vince Dunn, I think, was a good pickup from St. Louis. I think he'll be really good. Uh, Alexiak, I think, is old, but he'll, he'll be okay in the, in that role. Anyways, I think that their defense is going to be okay, and then Grubauer is a good good goalie. I think they'll be a decent team. I don't think they'll be bad. Um, I don't think they're going to do what Vegas did. I, I'm. I, I don't think so either. I'm hesitant to say it though because look what Vegas ended up doing. So yeah. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't think they're going to do what Vegas did, and then they turn well, they around had, I mean, and win the cup. So they had they had the perfect situation. I mean, first of all, they had Eric Carl, uh, Eric Carlson, um, William Carlson come out yeah. of nowhere and score like 40 goals. Yeah. James Neal has like a follow up to a great season with another great season. Uh, you know, they have Riley. Um, uh, I'm not forgetting the rest of their team, but they, they had they had plenty of plenty of players come in and step into to, to great roles, and then of course Mark Andre Fleury. They had a Hall of Fame goaltender, just plug and play. I mean, Philip Grubauer is not a Hall of Fame goaltender. There's just it's not. Um, I I was I was honestly very shocked they didn't get Jonathan Quick. That was weird to me, but anyways. Um, so Seattle, yeah, they'll, they'll be uh, the, that'll be an interesting test. I do think the Predators will win that game. I think that they'll they'll find a way to to, to beat Seattle and um, whether it's in regular seat, the regulation or overtime, I don't know. But then Carolina is going to be tough as well. I mean, Carolina probably. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Predators split these first two games, winning one and win, losing the other. But um, I could be surprised and they win both of them. But what, what do you think? Do you think they come away with two wins this week? 
I mean, you'd love to see it, right? You know, but I, I think they have a good chance to beat the Kraken. Carolina, you know, we've talked about for several years is a is a very mm-hmm. fast, speedy team. Um, yeah. Have they gotten faster? Have they gotten better? Have the Preds gotten faster? Have they gotten bigger? Have they gotten, um, you know, a little more intimidating? So there's there's some factors that have changed. So I think, I, I'm I interested to see full strength of both of those teams. We've as as we've mentioned, we've seen a lot of Carolina over the past you know few games. So uh, it should be you know it's a familiar thing, but the teams look a little bit different. So I'm I'm curious to see how that's going to play out on the ice. Um, should be a good game, you know, and as much as I'm excited to see Seattle and as much as I'm ready to kind of be done with Carolina for a while, I'm interested to see how those two games can kind of set the tone for this first part of the season, because I feel like if you can come out with two big wins, then you're showing like, Hey, we're competitive. Um, we're here. We're not just going to be in mired in development hell all year. So I think, I think there's definitely something to be said for, for focusing on coming away with two wins. Just got to see mm-hmm. if they can do it on the ice. Well, the good news is after Carolina on Saturday, and we'll talk about this next week too, but uh, they get a bunch of new teams they haven't seen in forever. Los yeah. Angeles, New York Rangers, Winnipeg Jets. They get the Minnesota Wild again. The Sharks, the Islanders. None of those teams from last year uh, that we got to- so tired of seeing, like Columbus and Carolina and Florida and stuff. Um, they, and, of course, Tampa. Um, so, yeah, that'll be – That'll be nice to see a whole slew of new teams coming into Bridgestone Arena and uh, for the Predators to play on the road. So, um, yeah, so there you go. That does it for our show. Uh, I think it was a pretty good first episode. What do you think? I'm, I'm happy with it. Not bad. Feels Not successful. Bad. We can always get – we can always uh, – we will imp- try to improve every episode. But uh, it'll be kind of like the same format uh, every week, and we'll try to throw in some stuff every now and then, maybe have some guests on. Who knows? And, um, yeah, so the, the, there you go. You can check out all of our hockey coverage at a to z sports nashville.com. And please also go to on the forecheck.com as well. You can reach Sean and all of his friends at OTF there. Uh, please follow me on Twitter at Alex Darty one. It's right there, right there below right there. And then, uh, follow Sean on Twitter at S C S O T F right there. And, uh, yeah, so we'll upload every Sunday. So, uh, any final thoughts from you, Sean, for going into this uh, first week, any final thoughts? I'm just I'm I'm ready to see some uh, regular season hockey. I'm excited. There you go. There you go. Can't wait. All right, we'll see everyone next week.